everyone and give this important thanks to study uh, and uh, as we do this we focus again our minds on our theme for the month the Lord is good so that is what we want to focus on in this message and this month of uh, August is the Lord good to you for these several weeks that have passed already? Is the Lord you, uh, good to your family, good uh, to the work, your profession, your business, whatever it is? Is the Lord good to you? So that is a very uh, uh, common word, but it is also something we need and something that in encourages us all the time. That. Uh, the Lord is good, so we need to be good to each other, and we need to uh, pray for each other because this is the will of God. And right now, we focus on uh, this uh, topic, God reveals his goodness. So God is so good, he reveals his goodness. God in his righteousness and holiness is good to his people and the world in general. So anywhere we go, we know that God is good. Because if he is not good, uh, we cannot experience his provision. We cannot experience good weather. We cannot experience good health, joy in the family, joy in our relationships. All these are part of God's goodness. And remember, God's goodness is not only to the, the people who believe him. He's also good to people in general. So right now, in the whole world, 29, uh, 2019, the Lord is uh, good to the whole world. And uh, so we need to show his goodness also. It's not only that there's a statement in the Bible that God, the Lord is good, but we have to prove it ourselves. We have to show it by our lives that the Lord is good. So there are two things I want us to focus tonight as we think of the goodness of uh, the Lord is good, of God. First, God shows his goodness. So we we'll look at uh, how he shows his goodness to us, and then God's abounding, abounding goodness in our daily experience. So God is good, yes. But what about today? What about tomorrow? Is he really good to you and me in specific things? that we experience in our lives. So this is what we want to answer as we think of the Word of God right now. God shows His goodness. So how does He show His goodness? He shows His goodness to His people. One verse that I have wrote, written here is Philippians chapter 4, verse 19. It's a familiar verse. Let me read this to you. This is what Paul said, and uh, my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. So God is so good, he supplies all our needs. This is uh, what Paul is saying here, and this is what I want to portray to you, that it in his goodness, he supplies all our needs. So today or last week, did you count and did you think about the needs that you have uh, uh, encountered? Can you say that the Lord has provided your needs? So we are now in the middle of August and uh, uh, people in the Philippines say that August is a time of uh, hard times and uh, it's hard to find money in the month of August. For the farmers, they have to wait for the harvest in order to have money. So that's why uh, in our country, when we think of August, people right away think of, you know, difficult times. But uh, God is not con uh, confined to uh, August only, or, or the troubles are not confined to the month of August. Troubles could come anytime. But 
On the other hand, God provides our needs not only on the month of August or some other months. He will supply all our needs every day of the year. So my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Number two here. He provides for the poor. So now look at you. Are you poor? We are all well dressed uh, tonight as we come to church. So I think nobody will say you are poor when you come to church. But uh, technically speaking, maybe generally speaking, all of us in a sense are poor because only God is rich. Only God owns the universe. But in another human way of describing, sometimes uh, the professionals, the business people, people with a big salary are not as, you know, hard pressed as people who do have nothing. And praise the Lord, practically all of us here tonight worshiping with us, you have work, you have family, you have uh, your needs met. So in a sense, we have something. But it's still true that uh, we are not as uh, well, I well, well fed or well supplied as we want to. Because every one of us wants to, to have more money, have more salary, more income every month. So in that sense, uh, I wrote this point, God provides for the poor. Because I know deep in our hearts when we look at ourselves and compare ourselves to the riches of God, we are poor, very poor indeed. And so the provident, providence of God is very important in the life of the Christian. Because as we grow older, uh, we need a lot of uh, supply for the different needs of our children and our family, as well as needs for, to meet you know, the demands of a modern world. So God is good because he provides. God is known for his providence. And even if we are not supplied as we want to be supplied, still God is providing our needs. So let us always remember that. And there are several poor people mentioned in the Bible whom God has praised. Lazarus, for example. You know, the one who was just waiting outside the home of the rich man. Waiting for whatever leftover the rich man has from his table to throw to him so that he could eat. Was uh, Lazarus a literal person during that time? We do not really know, but I, we know that there are many people who have a lot of needs. So once upon a time, maybe in our lives, we were like Lazarus with great needs. And we do not know where, where to get the needs. So like Lazarus, God is providing for our needs. The widow, Luke 16. The widow, you know, had nothing. But uh, she, the last two centavo in her pocket, she gave it to the church. Then the Lord noticed that because they were watching people who were giving money in, in the temple. So the Lord said, of all these people, rich people who gave, this widow gave the, the most precious gift, the most uh, uh, important amount of money than all of these people because she gave fr from everything out of her poverty. Well, all these people they gave, they still have much left over at home. So just some exaggerated illustration from the life of Christ to remind us that uh, it's still important that uh, we must believe that the Lord is the one who provides for our needs. And we must never come to the point in our lives when we can say, I have it made. Now I don't need anything. Just like that rich man, you know, who thank God that he had everything and the Lord said tonight I want your soul <laughs> so where will your money go so let's be careful 
with that important matter that our, this story reminds us about. And then another one here in the Old Testament, Chronicles chapter 30, verse 15, it's talking about, uh, you know, our sins, forgiving our sins. God wants us to take note of our sins and confess it before him. So the Lord is good. He supplies our needs. He provides for the poor. And uh, he provides uh, and he forgives our and so many sins we do commit every day. So many sins sometimes that we forget. In fact, we forget more of our sins than remember them. But we remember more the blessings. And uh, oh, the Lord reminds us our forgetfulness to thank him and to praise him is sin itself. So Israel has done that many times. It made God from God. He is abounding in loving kindness psalm 86 verse 5 i just verse that's written in my outline here psalm 86 verse 5 it says here for you lord are good and ready to forgive abound abundant in mercy to all those who call upon you so he is abundant in his grace and provision. Not only is it our connected loving kindness, which in the New Testament is simply translated to us a very simple one word, grace. And for us today, when we say grace, it's just everything and anything we receive from the Lord, anything that we recognize from him, all of these are part of his grace. And what more does God give his people? Part of his goodness, number four. I wrote here in my outline. He is a stronghold in time of trouble. Psalm chapter 9, verse 10. He is a stronghold in the time of trouble. As uh, we always uh, notice, there are so many troubles in our lives. Or the, the grandpa or the grandma. So all these, you know, are reasons for us to go to the Lord. He is our stronghold in the day of trouble. So remember that important Psalm, chapter 9, verse 10. In our culture, we go to important people to ask for help in time of trouble, which is, uh, in a sense, good. Though sometimes it's also bad. <laughs> Because we Filipinos tend to go to the politicians all the time for small or sometimes we, uh, we abuse the privilege, you know, from our leaders. Our leaders also spoil us. They just give anything we ask because they want us to vote for them during election. But oh, the goodness of the Lord in time of trouble. Uh, it's always there, not because God is a politician or God can be bought or can be uh, uh, convinced to do one more thing here. God is good to his people. Number five, God works all things for our good. Romans 8.28. That's a very popular verse, very ordinary to many of us. But, you know, the lesson we learn from this important verse is repeated again and again. And every time we learn a new lesson, we understand it better. God works everything for our good. Have you experienced that this week? How the Lord is good to you? Sometimes even things that we think are bad are still good for us. So in the Old Testament, Abraham had no children. And God promised him to make him a great nation. So how can that be solved? How can God be good in promising Abraham to become a new nation and that he has no child? Well, you know the story. He gave him Isaac. And then when Isaac was a teenager, the Lord said, you go and sacrifice Isaac. So the Lord promised Abraham to be a nation now. 
the only son that he has given him the Lord asked him sacrifice him where did he sacrifice him in Mount Moriah and they went there and Isaac asked his father father we need to have sacrifice to the Lord we have the wood for the fire and where is the sacrifice and Abraham said my son the Lord will provide well we all know that uh, a very thrilling story because Abraham you know put up 12 stones to represent you know Israel and then he 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 took his son put him on top of that stone and then he took the knife to slay him when he was about to slay him there was the angel of the Lord who called him Abraham God has seen your sincerity and your love for him God only was testing you don't kill your child now look over on the other side there is in the thick in the thicket uh, a lamb there you take it up and then sacrifice him in place of his son so it was a beautiful story which now we understand because that Mount Moriah is about the place of the cross or the place where Jesus Christ was uh, hanged on the cross and died for our sins and uh, so symbolically speaking Abraham just like Jesus Christ I mean Isaac died and then he gave him his resurrection so today God works all things for our good what are your crosses what are your calvaries what are your difficulties but you see in our lives we must always have a calvary we must always have difficulties otherwise we will be so spoiled we don't will not pray anymore we will not uh, uh, ask to surrender to the Lord anymore so that leads us to this final point here and uh, the way we could apply this message to our lives today God's abounding goodness in our daily experience so that's now 2019 our actual experience last week our actual experience today our actual experience next week number one uh, one the Lord wants us to experience his goodness by obeying him so we go to Psalm 116 verse 12 12 and 13 we have to obey the Lord what shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits toward me I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord 14 I will pay my vows to the Lord now in the presence of all his people Psalm 116 it's a psalm of thanksgiving about God's deliverance for his people who trust him so what are the things that uh, uh, we should thank him about what are the gifts that the Lord has given us so here in the notes I just want to enumerate just briefly a salvation you know when we die we go to heaven through our faith to the Savior Jesus Christ so this is an important gift our salvation now you take that word salvation under that the Bible is teaching us so many things about salvation number one that I wrote here in the notes election what is election in our salvation we were chosen to be saved and the choosing to be saved God did that in a future I mean in in the past that we can never fathom because God has no beginning and the end so in that beginning that was not the beginning when God was there he already you know, chose you and me to save us from the eternity past it is the word that the uh, theologians said election it's been mentioned by Paul in Romans elect of God the doctrine of election we have been elected to be saved <clears throat> well sometimes connected with our word election you know uh, in our country uh, several months ago we had an election 
So the word election is something like that, applied to our faith in the Lord and in our salvation. But in this election that is mentioned here in connection with our gift of salvation from God, it happened, you know, in the eternity past. We could not fathom how long ago it was, but there was always God, there was always with Him, the Son and the Spirit, there was always with Him, His plan for the world and the future. And in that plan, He chose me and He chose you, that is election now. Because election means, in a human standpoint, it is choosing the president or choosing the senator or choosing the, the governor or the mayor. So that word election is applied there to God's choosing us to be saved in Jesus Christ. Second, regeneration. So I have been elected to be saved. You have been elected to be saved. We are regenerated, born again. We have to be born again because we, we were born in sin. We were born as children of the devil. We have to be born again to have salvation through Jesus Christ, to have new life and salvation. Not only regenerated, justified. When I was a sinner, my sins are so terrible. And so who could erase my sins? So my sin has to be punished and paid by someone. And so it was the Lord, you know. He paid it with his blood and his death. And then he, he used it to wash away my sins. I am now justified, qualified in other words, to live forever in heaven and to be saved and to enjoy the blessings of children of God. So that is the word just. I am satisfied, sanctified by my sin through the washing of the blood of Jesus Christ. I can say it like this, just as if I never sinned. That, according to one theologian, was the meaning of the word sanctification. Sanctify means to make righteous. The sinner, to make him the criminal, to erase his crime. That is sanctification. So just as if I never sinned. We have always been sinners. We were sinners. <coughs> When we were born, we were sinners through our parents. We were sinners through the first father and mother, Adam and Eve. So all this has been erased now because of the justification of the blood of Jesus Christ. Because we are in the world, we live with people who have not accepted the Lord Jesus Christ in the office, in the classroom. When you ride in the jeep or in the in the boat or in the plane, many people there have not accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we have to live with people in the world, but the Lord said, even if you live with people in the world, you have to separate from them. In one aspect, we are with them. In another aspect, we are not with them because the moment we do wrong things, we do not agree. The moment they do not, they hate God and uh, uh, allow their lives and their families and other people to commit sin we always oppose that so that is the meaning of separation from the world we are here in the world but we are not of it because we live separately and it's very hard you know to walk you know in that how to walk nimbly live in the world there are so many temptations so many Terrible things like nails and uh, thumbtacks that are very pointed. So how do we walk, you know, nimbly in such a way that we walk in the world and yet not affected by its sin? So we walk like the cat, the earring. Yung maglakaw-lakaw to sa taas, to sa badpadero, sa mga butilya nga nabuak, o sa mga... The cat can do that. The Christian can do better, di ba? We live in the world, but we are not of the world. We can always ask the Lord to, to help us, the Holy Spirit to remind us, the Word of God to strengthen us, and uh, the righteousness of Christ to always lead us and direct us. So we are in the world, but not of it. And then, sanctified in the world, then this is our life calling. What is your life calling? Have you... 
So he determined already what is your calling in the, as in the world. Are, are you called to be an engineer, Christian? Are you called to be a businessman, Christian? Are you called to be a, a scholar, Christian? Are you called to be a, a technocrat, Christian? So all the time you are called to be that, I am called to be that. So we have to pursue our life calling to the very end without being influenced or affected by the world because if we are affected, it will destroy, you know, our direction toward our call, life calling. So we must be firm in pursuing the calling that the Lord has given us. And all the time, the next word is witnessing. Are you always a witness for the Lord? Are you always, uh, is he always directing you and giving you guidance? And are you following it? And uh, are you always a good testimony to people around you? And then, second to last, live by faith. We live by faith, not by sight. Every day of our lives, in the go beyond what God wants us to do. And of course, all the while, as we do all this from election to regeneration, etc., etc., we have the last one, suffering. Because as long as we walk in this world, there will always be suffering. Since Adam and Eve committed sin, there are always thorns. There are always uh, thorns in the road. There are always floods and typhoons. There are always uh, failures in our investments and in our ambitions. So suffering. So learn to live with suffering. Have you learned to do that? Can you smile in the midst of your heartache? Can you laugh, you know? Problems. You say, Lord, I just prayed, so never mind my problems. Make me happy today. Make me work as if I am working for you. And all the problems and the sufferings will just be there. They'll always be there. But, oh, I'm not concentrating my mind on them. I am not... Uh, putting all my attention on them I am concentrating on my joy in the Lord and in the solutions that God is giving me I am con concentrating on prayer and trusting Him so the sufferings become stepping stones <coughs> to glory stepping stones to success stepping stones to accomplishment stepping stones to improving my life so that's what I mean obedience to the Lord taking the gift of salvation and all parts of that salvation in a bunch with the sufferings and then putting it all, all of that on the shoulders of Jesus Christ. So as you obey him, as I obey him, our burdens become light. We can sleep well, we can smile, we can laugh, we can succeed in the midst of our failures we can stand again and go back do things all over again if possible if not then thank you lord i it's okay if there are things i cannot fulfill in my in my life i can die at peace <laughs> because i have already accomplished what i should have accomplished so that's how we look at life this is what i mean by obedience you put that in a bank, bunch and that all means obedience so so what shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits towards me I will take that cup of salvation so all those blessings and salvation now number two and then the psalmist said I will call upon the name of the Lord this means despite all the hardships in life we can have devotion you say Lord I believe I can do anything you want me to do you have a plan for me, and if I pursue it, you will be there to help me. And then what you do? What do I do as I face uh, all these things, Lord? I go back to what you told me I could do. For example, here in Ephesians. Ephesians. What did the Lord uh, say here? There are many things I, I need to, to do here, but uh, I have to... Obey him. Ephesians chapter 4, 
and uh, I have to I am a new man I have everything new in the Lord Jesus Christ Ephesians chapter 5 I walk in love I walk in the light I walk in wisdom so all these things the Lord has given me and then uh, another thing that uh, we need to remember is uh, we go back to uh, Genesis I mean Galatians chapter 5 what are these now these are uh, part, you know, as we meditate on the Word of God, we call upon His name, we grow in faith and character. So, Galatians chapter 5, 22 and 23, Christian character that we can ask from Him to put in our lives. What is this? It is the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, Gen gentleness, self-control all this are part of the fruit of the spirit so we are calling upon his name and if we call upon his name we meditate we exp do our devotions we pray, ask for his help in problems and trials he will make us grow in faith and in character and what a wonderful character the Christian has if you have the spirit the fruit of the spirit so what kind of Christian are you? Are you a Christian with the fruit of the Spirit? So have you been filled with the fruit of the Spirit today? Or did you fail in claiming the fruit of the Spirit today? Tomorrow or next week? What are the problems you are going to, to, to meet? Are you continually claiming this fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5, 22 and 23? So you should, because this is part of our calling and blessing from the salvation that the Lord has given us. And then number three and last, God's abounding goodness in our daily lives. Fruit, fulfill our vows to the Lord, you know, as we continue to live in the world. So once in a while, we do have promises. And that brings us again to Psalm 116. We promise the Lord to do this and that. We like to make promises, diba? Children make promise to their parents. Okay, mom, dad, I will study hard so that uh, I will have high grades and then I will pass my uh, course. And when I pass my course, I take the board, I will pass it again. And then I have uh, my own income. I could help you in some of family projects. So here, Psalm 116, uh, verse 5, what does... The psalmist do. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Yes, O God, our God is merciful. So, you do what you have promised. It's gracious. I will fulfill. What are your dreams and what are the things you want in your life? Uh, Psalm 116, uh, verse uh, 14. I will pay my vows to the Lord now in the presence of all his people. You know, as uh, people of God, once in a while, yes, I already mentioned we make promises, we make uh, desires, we make dreams. Promising to a girl, a girl is promising to a boy. Uh, the son is pro promising to his dad. The daughter is promising to, his, uh, to her mother. Student is promising to her teacher. Teacher, I will pass my assignment. I will pass the subject. So promises, promises. It's uh, maybe part of human life to make promises. Otherwise, if it's, uh, I mean, promises is, is a disturbance of our peace in this world. The Lord will ne never put the word promise in his word. <laughs> he will never put the word promise in our vocabulary, the truth. Diba? So promises, promises. When you get married, you promise your, your wife. You promise your husband. So it's not wrong to make promises because even God makes promises. And in our human, uh, human uh, way of doing things, the word promise and promises are always part of our human activity. So... Fulfill your vows to the Lord, whatever it is that you have promised. And if you, go, you want to promise him, okay, it's okay, you pray. Lord, 
Is this okay if I make you a promise? So the Lord will say, okay, you make your promise, you go. And more than that, if you are a believer, can you be ambitious? Can you be, have a spiritual ambition? So we encourage our children to, be, to, have, to have a goal, to have a dream. Right? We encourage our children to do that. And so even God wants us to have a goal and a dream, spiritual ambitions. <coughs> so these are the things that are connected to God's abounding goodness in our day-to-day -day existence. He is helping us make our vows and our promises and fulfill them in His will and in His promise. So it's not wrong to make promises. It's not wrong to have ambition because people of God since the beginning always made those promises and those ambitions. And by God's grace, they fulfilled well, maybe majority. Maybe they did not fulfill some, but at least majority of them were fulfilled because it is God's will, part of the goodness of God. So, dear Christian, tonight, as we close this message, do you believe that God is good? And because He is good, do you believe that uh, He has saved you, given you the gift of salvation? He elected you, He regenerated you, He justified you, sanctified you, separated you from the world. He gave you a life calling, He made you a witness, and He made you a life of faith, by faith, a life by faith, and yet He gave you sufferings over which you could conquer and be victorious over all of those. So, that is part of the abounding goodness of God in our daily life existence and because of that I said to you call upon his name have a daily devotion daily prayer and uh, in the times of problems goodness that the spirit is teaching me to do and whatever are the greater ambitions you have in your life you can say Lord yes I have greater and better